All right, Billy, this does take us to Article 3. Um, we just finished talking about trachs. Now let's talk about intubation with adults. And this is a study that's actually, I think, very interesting. I have a couple little tweaky things about it, but I, I like the idea. So this is called bag mask ventilation during tracheal intubation of critically ill adults by the PREVENT investigators, P-R-E, capital V-E-N-T, investigators in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was published uh, in February of 2019. And it's an interesting idea. It's paired with an editorial. And the editorial is titled Preventing Dogma from Driving Practice. And I think the whole point of this article was that we've been, a lot of us have been taught not to bag while we're trying to intubate. And this says, wait a minute, let's see if that's really a reasonable practice. We know that intubation, and we, we know, and I'm not sure the exact percentage, this has percentages in the ICU because this is an ICU study, but the percentages of patients that actually get hypoxic while we're trying to intubate varies, but we know it occurs. We know for certain that it occurs. There are people who come in already hypoxic. There are people who, who develop hypoxia while we're intubating them. This particular paper says that 40% of intubations that occur in the ICU note that there's some hypoxia that occurs and that theoretically increases the risk of cardiac arrest and death. And of course it does, that how many people actually go on to have arrest and death isn't clear, but the, we know that it can definitely exacerbate things. We're also taught that when we use RSI, so we do this sort of induction paralysis thing um, after pre-oxygenating, that we're supposed to wait 45 to 90 seconds um, before the paralytic drug actually works. And that's absolutely true. If you use sucks, it's about 45 seconds or so. If you use rock at higher doses, it's 60 seconds or so. If you use more standard doses of things, it could be 90 seconds before you actually have the patient paralyzed enough to intubate. So you have this window, this, this from induction to actually paral you know, intubation sort of window where people can get hypoxic. And the question that this this paper poses is, is it safe to bag people during that time? Because we're all taught not to. Don't bag them. You know, hang out there. Just don't bag them. Just if they desaturate, maybe, but otherwise don't. And we also are and the reason we're taught that basically is this risk of aspiration. If you bag somebody, there's this risk of aspiration. Um, we're trying to balance hypo hypoxia risk and aspiration risk. So the p teaching for us has been forever. And I, as a, somebody who taught airway stuff for a long time, I taught people don't stand back, do not bag, tell that respiratory therapist to put the bag down. This, this paper says, wait a minute, is that really, is it really reasonable? Let's just stand back a second and say, is that really what we need to do? So the point of this trial, the prevent trial, is to determine the effect of bag valve mask on hypoxemia during induction. So that's the goal. Okay, like we're going to do it on purpose. We're going to go in there on purpose and let's see what happens to these people. So the, the patient population they studied was an ICU. So it's ICU patients being intubated using RSI. And that is one thing I do want to sort of step back a little bit and just say that this is, this is people who've been in the ICU for a while. They kind of know what's happening with them. It's not the same patient population as our critically ill need to be intubated, sometimes undifferentiated as to why they're hypoxic group. We don't know anything yet. We just know they are. So it's not a exactly the same patient population, but the concept is good. Um, they had really appropriate inclusion and exclusion criteria in this paper, you know, who should or shouldn't be intubated, you know, uh, put in the study. And all of those I think were quite reasonable and I won't bore you with them. You can look them up if you want, but they were appropriate. And what they did is they, they randomized the patients one to one. Bag valve, you know, either you were bagged or not bagged during that period from induction to going ahead and trying to intubate, to put so putting the, the, the ringoscope down. In the bagged group, so if you happen to be randomized to the group that, that on purpose was going to get bagged, during the time from induction, the drugs given, to laryngoscopy, I put something in there and looked down, they got bagged with a protocol. They were all taught how to do this appropriately. They had 15 liters per minute of oxygen. They had a PEEP valve set up and they actually had a PEEP measured at five to 10 centimeters of water. They all had an OP airway put in place. They had a two handed mask seal with a chin lift head tilt sort of maneuver here. So this is actually a really good seal. The breaths were given at 10 per minute at a rate of 10 per minute. And the volume was titrated at chest rise. So it was basically, they would look for the chest to rise and they would stop the uh, sort of the um, ventilation. What they didn't mention in the article, so I'm assuming it did not happen, is they didn't use cricoid pressure. So, but I will tell you, this is not specifically mentioned, so I'm extrapolating that, um, but cricoid pressure is not mentioned here in the article. So the bagging technique is actually quite good uh, as far as whether this is appropriate bagging. And, and that was standardized. That was meant to be standardized. The group that didn't get bagged in that sort of induction to laryngoscope, you know, laryng laryngoscopy group, they weren't bagged unless they couldn't intubate them when they looked down with the laryngoscope. So they were having trouble. The patient got hypoxic to less than 90% while dur during that sort of 
intubate that period from induction to laryngoscope. Or if the clinician just said, I, I want it, I think it's necessary. So the, the clinician got to make that call. But everything else for, and, and, and those, in, the, in the whole patient population altogether was at the discretion of the clinician in particular. What was at the discretion of the, of the treating clinicians were the method of pre-oxygenation. So they could choose just non-rebreather mask. They could choose high flow nasal cannula. They could choose non-invasive. That was not standardized ahead of time, which is another potential glitch in this study, but actually it turns out to be reverse. I'll tell you why in a second. So that was something that was chosen by the the clinicians themselves. That was totally at their discretion, up to the point of induction. And then apneic oxygenation wasn't mandated. So this idea of keeping a high flow nasal cannula on during the intubation attempt, that wasn't mandated, but it was allowed for either group. And they kind of kept track of who got that and who didn't in their sort of data gathering. Nobody though, if they if they were on non-invasive ventilation, so say it's you know it's somebody in the bag valve mask group or the non-bag valve mask group who was on some sort of non-invasive ventilation, once induction happened, they had to turn it off. It wasn't allowed to have non-invasive ventilation after induction. So that wasn't allowed to happen during the induction period, which makes sense, right? We're trying to see if that induction period, bag or no bag, what it make, if it makes a difference. Their primary outcome was the lowest oxygen saturation during that interval, that induction to to did an interval from induction to two minutes after the intubation. So the interval of, of I gave you the drug and now we're two minutes after I've intubated you and I've you know hopefully bagging you and getting you up. That that what was the lowest saturation that happened there? A secondary income was the incidence of severe hypoxemia defined as less than 80% sat during that same interval, induction to two minutes after tracheal intubation. And then they looked at a couple additional outcomes, which they needed to, otherwise the study would have been, I think, pretty not help, not helpful. They looked at the oropharyngeal or gastric aspiration um, that was reported by the operator. So I'm the intubator, and I said, "Wow, you know, the burrito just came north, and uh, you know, it's all I can see right now is that, and the presence of a new opacity on chest X-ray within 48 hours after intubation. So that that as a sort of maybe this was an aspiration event that did happen that we didn't see happen during the intubation. Now, I do want to mention something. Remember, these are ICU patients and this outcome of did I see something aspirate or did they actually aspirate? These are people who are in ICUs. So odds are they are empty stomach people. So this is another place where this study translating it to the emergency department may be a little bit more problematic. These people who got bagged doesn't necessarily have the burrito down there. They may they probably had nothing down there. So it's another thing that makes this study a little bit difficult to apply right in our in our sort of environment. They were able to recruit four. 101 patients. It's a lot. And they were bagged, 199 were bagged and 202 were not ventilated. So we basically had 200-ish in the bag group and 200-ish in the no ventilation group. Uh, most of the patients had sepsis or septic shock and 60% had hypoxemic respiratory failure. So to, re to kind of review, it was about 200 in each of the groups. Most of these patients in the ICU were there for sepsis or septic shock and 60% had hypoxemic respiratory failure. So if you kind of look at sort of what the characteristics of this group, the people that before induction, getting non-invasive or high flow, so how many people got like extra oxygen before they got induced? Well, that turned out to be more common in the no ventilation group. So the bag valve mask group was less likely to be non-invasive or high flow before induction. Why do I care about that? It's, actually, and it's almost twice as much. 44% of people in the no ventilation group so this is the non-bagged group, got this extra oxygen up front and 27% of the bag didn't. So you, so the odds, you would think that what that would do is mean that the per people who get bagged um, would start with maybe less oxygen ahead of time. They didn't get this super high oxygen and we'll see what happens in the long run, but it turns out that, that this idea of, hmm, they didn't get as much oxygen up front, that those people who didn't get bagged are better off to start may not prove to be the case. We'll see what the results show. The bagging before induction, people in the bag valve mess group got that more often. And that makes sense, right? I've got the bag right there. You're in that study group anyway. I'm going to grab that and use that. O2 sat was, this, was similar at the time of induction. So at the time the drugs were dropped, the drugs were pushed. The two groups had similar sort of oxygen saturations. Most of them actually had the high 90s, some even 99 to 100%. And then most of them both got an induction agent and a paralytic. Again, the drugs were the choice of the operator. It wasn't standardized. So that was, some, and most of them got both kinds of agents. So let's look at what happened. What are the outcomes here? 
So the primary outcome, remember that's the median lowest oxygen saturation in that window from getting the drug to two minutes after intubation. The median lowest O2 saturation, the bad group was 96% and the no bad group was 94%. And I have to tell you clinically, that's an irrelevant difference. It makes no difference clinically. So this idea of, of the bagging making a difference as far as not, not bagging getting lower, it did get lower, but not enough to make a difference. The mean difference was about four percentage points below um, overall. But honestly, this turns out, I think the primary outcome was not clinically significant. However, the secondary outcome ended up being pretty significant. So this idea of a, how many people had a SAT actually drop less than 80%. We know we start to, we're down that slippery slope, right? We're down that oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve on that when we're getting to 80%. It's the, the boo, 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 boo. I mean, things are really not going well. The bad group only had that happen. So um, the people that got bagged on purpose only had that happen 10.9% of the time. And the no bag group had it happen twice as often, 22.8% of the time. So 21 patients versus 45. So that basically says bagging somebody decreases the likelihood of them really dropping through the floor on somebody who 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 needs who gets saturated their saturations falling now sats below 90 percent were also less in the bad group and the the group so less like the bad group overall was less likely to ever get below 70 percent so so the median was the same in the both but the few that did drop off the bottom was less likely if you got bagged other outcomes. So operator reported aspiration events were not significantly different. They were the same in both groups, two to 4%. So pretty much the same in both groups. And the new opacity on x-ray was also similar in the two groups. So aspiration events, if that's how we're going to measure it, were about the same in both groups and all other secondary outcomes were similar. And again, remember this aspiration concept is in an empty stomached ICU person versus a full stomached ER person. So what they basically said is when they discussed this is that using a bag means you're less likely to really bottom out your oxygen saturation. Um, it doesn't mean that you're, it, it basically just says, I'm going to keep you higher, more likely. You're less likely to actually bottom out in this particular group. Um, and so for the ICU group, again, not the same as ours, but the ICU group using a bag has a number needed to treat of nine to prevent hypoxia. There was no evidence of increased aspiration in this particular ICU study. And the limitations here I mentioned. So a couple things about it. I already mentioned that it's an ICU patient population, which means that they kind of have know a lot about the person more than we would know in an ER and that the stomach is probably empty. The other thing just inherent to the study though, is remember some of the patients got non-invasive ventilation. Some got high flow nasal cannula as a pre-oxygenation. Some just got supplemental oxygen. Some even got bagged. The problem with that is say you hit a uh, saturation of 99 to hundred percent. Well, what that really means when you look at a PAO2 is anything from a PAO2 of 9,900 to, you could have a PAO2 of 400 if you're in a SAT of 100%. So I don't really know the buffer of PAO2 in that group that's 99 to 100%. So I'm not sure what wiggle room I have here that may, some of these people may have had a lot of oxygen in their system where they would have never really desaturated. And that wasn't really standard. It would have been nice to know the PAO2 levels in these people. Although honestly, we use SATs in general. So this that would just been a little more, more accurate. So to summarize this article in one, one quick slide, that basically bagging between induction and laryngoscopy, bagging them on purpose, is associated with higher SATs, less likely, uh, and that probably not clinically significant, but less likelihood, serious desaturation, no apparent risk of aspiration, but not just a larger study is needed, a study of this in the ER is needed to see if this actually applies to our patient population. And the, and the editorial that accompanies this article basically is, is an art, editorial that says ch challenge dogma. You know, if things just, if you sit back and think about it, some of the things we do routinely may not be the right thing to do. So it's worth studying. I like the fact they did this study. I just would like to see it done in the emergency room. So Billy, what do you think about this study? Yeah, I mean, um... So for me, a lot of this study was sort of an exercise in lost in translation. And you've already touched on it. The ED population is very different. So for the people in the ED who are being intubated who don't have hypoxia or are not at risk for hypoxia, they're not having a respiratory problem, maybe they're head injured or something like that, um, I think they're at pretty low risk for desaturating and I wouldn't want to bag them in between there. Um, the aspiration rates, two and a half percent in one, four percent in another, with a, with group sizes of two hundred in each group, if those continue to diverge, it, it, that could be really important. And then, in terms of the lost in translation kind of thing, I always remember um, Ron Walls, 
uh, for example, sort of, if you will, the father of rapid sequence intubation, reminding us over and over again that rapid sequence induction and rapid sequence intubation are not the same thing. Rapid sequence induction is something that anesthesiologists do as they're preparing to get an optimal state in a pre-op patient. And rapid sequence intubation is specifically what we do in the emergency department. And there was a lot of that failure to translate that across. The other thing is, um, you know, we use high flow nasal oxygen virtually on everyone. We're beginning to change the positions in which we're intubating in. I would have liked to know a lot more about what they did to manage their hypoxia prior. And I have a little bit of an issue with the big differences of the bag valve mass between the groups, although it didn't really play out to mean much in this particular study. But for me, there is a sort of lost in translation sort of feature here. What I did take from it, which is that number needed to treat of nine to prevent hypoxia, is that if a patient starts dropping and you haven't established an airway, then I don't have a problem with your bag and I'm a little bit in there. Why would you wait for the disaster to occur when you could cut it off at the pass? Um, if I anticipate that an intubation is going very easily and, um, you know, there's no reason to anticipate problems with this, I still think that Ron Walls, who was the dogma maker, which is don't bag them after paralysis, is still probably right for a lot of those intubations in the emergency <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. And I think one of the hazards of a paper like this getting thrown into something that every emergency, you know, board certified emergency physician has to read and then take a test on is to instantly translate it into your practice as dogma. It's the same problem now on the yep. other end of the spectrum. And I and the reality is so much of what we do is nuanced and so much of what we do is judgment. There are very few things that are truly black and white. You must do this. You must never do that. Um, and this is something where I, we've all bagged people when we're trying to intubate them when we know we're having trouble or we know they're starting to desat. We've all done it. So it's not like it's an all or none phenomenon. There's our judgment gets thrown in there. And so this is I, what I don't want people to take home from this paper is I should be bagging everybody as soon as I induce them. You know, or peril, I should be, it's no, 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 no. That's not the, the, the case by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's an interesting idea. It does challenge dogma. And I totally agree with you. This is something that's hard to translate to our setting the way it's done here. Yeah, I assume all patients that I'm intubating in the emergency department have something in their stomach that I don't want to invite to the party. Well, they almost um, always do, yeah. right? It's amazing. Yeah. It's remarkable. I also think that, um, you know, there's been so much more em emphasis on what is the status of the patient before you begin their intubation procedure in yeah. terms of resuscitating them to make sure that their maps are up in terms of uh, pre-oxygenating them. And if you're having trouble pre-oxygenating them, bringing delayed sequence intubation uh, to play and things like that, where the yeah. procedure that's happening first is oxygenation. So again, a little bit of loss in translation, and I think it would be a mistake to say you should bag everyone after you've induced them. Um, uh, and certainly, um, I don't do that for the majority of patients. But if, I, if the patients if we're having problems and the patient's desaturating, I don't got a problem doing it. Um, at all. Oh my gosh, you actually use judgment, clinical judgment. Shocking. Shocking. <laughs>